There's old school Michigan defense in an old school Big Ten football game. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, just minutes after Michigan disposed of Iowa 10 to 3 at the big house. And yes, 10 to 3 pretty much spells out what type of game it was with the Wolverines moving on to 1 and 1 in the Big Ten. Iowa falls to 1 and 1. These two teams, after taking in the action, basically are very similar. Similar in quality. If they played 10 times, I wouldn't be surprised if they split 5-5. Five and five. But at the big house on this day, Michigan won because of two major reasons. Secondary play, pass rush. That's why Michigan won this game over Iowa. And again, a 10-3 score in which Iowa... Could move the ball a little bit. They consistently drove the ball inside the Michigan 40. Then they bogged down. They didn't seriously threaten to score a touchdown the entire game as the Michigan defense was just way too much. And this is what it all came down to was the Michigan pass rush was way too much. They had eight or nine sacks on the day, and that doesn't really speak to the pressure. It was constant. It was basically... (laughs) 90% of the plays in which Nate Stanley would drop back to pass. Uh, Stanley came into the game having thrown 136 consecutive passes without being picked off. Because of pressure in this game, at least on two of the three throws, he was picked off by Michigan three times. Nathan Stanley, 64% completion percentage, eight touchdowns, no picks coming in. Picked off three times again on a 22 for 43 day, but it was the Michigan pass rush and it was the blitzes called by Don Brown that continually found gaps in the Iowa offensive line. I was very disappointed in Iowa's pass protection. It was pretty much non-existent. Nate Stanley didn't have a chance. Uh, He didn't play a great game. He didn't throw the ball uh, well consistently when he did have time, but he probably only had time on 43 passes. And over 50 dropbacks, Nate Stanley had time 10 or 12 times to throw the ball legitimately. He was ambushed consistently. And again, it was the Michigan front four, but most of the time it was Don Brown dialing up a particular blitz that worked. And Iowa could never adjust. So blame that on the Iowa defensive staff and the offensive line's inability to adjust in pass protection the entire game to the Michigan Blitz. Cam McGrone had a big day in replacing the injured Josh Ross. Quiddy Pay was all over the place. This kid is one of the best players in the Big Ten, and he proves it again today with three sacks for Michigan. Aiden Hutchinson's an emerging star for the Wolverines. He had a big day and forced a fumble early in the day that led to Michigan's first score to make it 3 to nothing on the uh, Mackay Sargent fumble, a play that was blown up by Kalik Hudson, tremendous play that he made in just manhandling the offensive front, blowing up the play, getting in the backfield, and forcing the fumble. Uh, actually, uh, Hutchinson forced the fumble, and it was recovered by Ambry Thomas. That got Michigan off and running at that point at 3 to nothing as Iowa made the stop in the red zone. And we didn't know how important that score would be. It was mighty important in this one. Nico Collins uh, hauled in a 51-yard bomb. uh, And uh, that led to Michigan's only score uh, in regards to a touchdown on the Zach Charbonnet touchdown to make it 10 to nothing. And that would hold up as Iowa could only mount the field goal. But back to the Michigan formula, it was the front seven, the pressure, the blitzes that uh, continually fooled Iowa and Nathan Stanley. But on the back end, their defensive backfield played an exceptional game. Look at all the times that Iowa receivers had a chance to catch the football and Michigan continually covered them, broke up passes, deflected passes, and again, three interceptions for the Michigan secondary. Lavert Hill also in supporting the run and supporting some screen plays. So there was a particular play, meaningful sequence in which Iowa was down 10 to 3. It's a late third quarter, early fourth down play in which they had the wide open screen play to the right side that had worked a couple times. Lavert Hill dodged the offensive lineman, upended the runner, made a great play. Otherwise, there's wide open green grass for Iowa to convert the third down uh, on the screen play and run for a ton of yardage. Daxton Hill made a great play on the le- very last play of the game. He and Kalik Hudson in uh, the, the play in which Nathan Stanley under ambush again. Last play of the game looked like the rest of the game. He didn't have a chance to throw. He switched the ball to his left hand to to try to save the game. Remarkably completed the pass on that swing, and it looked like 
uh, Iowa had a chance to make something of it and convert on fourth down, but uh, Daxton Hill and Kalik Hudson uh, made the play to stop the fourth down miracle attempt. And really, the Michigan secondary clamped down on an Iowa wide receiver core that has more speed and dynamic playmaking ability than they've had in ages with Amir Smith-Marset and Brandon Smith coming into the game, both with 15 catches and three touchdowns. And again, Iowa's ability to stretch the field because they've got a future NFL quarterback and they've got wide receivers who have speed and dynamic playmaking ability in comparison to what Iowa typically has. But the Michigan cornerbacks and secondary routinely shut it down. Josh Metellus had an excellent game as well uh, in breaking down uh, breaking up some passes. He also had a big interception in which Nathan Stanley was trying to go deep on the fade down the right sideline, and Metellus read it. Uh, Stanley shouldn't have thrown the ball, and Metellus made the play on the ball and intercepted. The Michigan offense is supposed to be great this year with Josh Gaddis at the controls, uh, spreading the ball around, spacing uh, the defense. The wide receiver is supposed to be in play as one of the best units in college football. We're still waiting for this to happen. This is not a great offense. It's not a good offense right now. Shea Patterson's not playing well. So when he does have time to throw, he's not playing well. And today, the offensive front actually did the job for Michigan in pass protection. Shea Patterson typically had time to throw, typically. And that's against an excellent Iowa defense, one of the 15 best defenses in the country, an excellent front linebacking core, certainly, and secondary for Iowa. They're strong on all three levels of defense. And... Uh, the Michigan offensive line actually gave Shea Patterson some decent time to throw, and he only went 14 for 28. He was inaccurate. He made some decent throws at times, but bad decisions, inaccuracy again, kind of loose with the football again as well. We heard time and time again from the game analysis, and it's true that Michigan is supposed to have one of the top wide receiver cores in the country, Tariq Black, Nico Collins in particular, this Ronnie Bell I've been most impressed with. Uh, he's the 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 lowest uh, touted of the wide receivers coming out of high school wasn't uh, supposed to be a big-time player, but he's been the best big play guy that Michigan's had at the wide receiver position this year and been the most productive and the most consistent. He had a key drop in the game as well. And uh, really, Michigan didn't try to push the ball downfield, or maybe that was Shea Patterson uh, and his lack of ability to get it downfield or see those opportunities because – how many defensive backfields have guys that are big enough, tall enough to match up against uh, big wide receiver units? And that's what we had today. We had a mismatch match in regards to size, a difference between the Michigan wide receiver unit and the Iowa cornerbacks, but Michigan did not try to take advantage in this one. Michigan continues to be lackluster trying to run the ball. They've got one running back, Zach Jarbetang, and he's a freshman, so they don't want to overwork him after that 33-carry game against Army, and Jim Harbaugh addressed that this week. So Zach Jarbetang comes away with just 13 carries and 42 yards as Michigan couldn't move it. But again, it was the Michigan defense uh, being that much better than what the Iowa defense was against the Michigan offense. It was the one big play to Nico Collins for 51 yards that led to the Michigan score. Otherwise, this is a stalemate as Michigan completely put the clamps on the Iowa offense and only gave up one yard rushing. Now, again, if you watch me on a regular basis, you know that I don't like the way college statistics are compiled. Iowa ran for more than one yard, but with all those sacks, Michigan technically only gave up one yard rushing. Torin Young did have eight carries for 40 yards. What's next for Iowa? This might be the best team in the Big Ten Western Division. Might be. We'll see them play Wisconsin head-to-head. -head. I believe those are the two best teams in the division. I'm going to have to see more out of Nebraska, but after what the way they were manhandled and abused by Ohio State, most likely it's the Badgers and the Hawkeyes. But as we talked about most of the offseason, Iowa has to deal with the most difficult schedule in the Big Ten, and that continues. After a trip to Michigan, they come home and they got to play Penn State, who's playing just about as well as anybody in the Big Ten outside of Columbus. For Michigan, they've got uh, an easy touch next week at Illinois. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down Michigan, Iowa with Wolverine surviving at 10-3. Big win for Jim Harbaugh. 
uh, trying to avert the criticism and what could be uh, a season that would have imploded had they lost this game against the Hawkeyes. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe right here at the Voice of College Football.